I'm not mad at people, I'm just sad, I'm disappointed. How could you go along with this? You know it's not true, but you're saying it anyway. We all know that feeling. You lie about something and all of a sudden you're a prisoner of that lie. You are diminished by it. You are weak and afraid. So I thought I would just pass on a couple of things that I have learned or think that I've learned over years of watching politicians campaign. Things that I think Republican voters need to remember, particularly now. So there's this weird dynamic where however high the dissatisfaction Republican voters have for their own leaders, the other side is so menacing, so scary at this point, a combination of fully embraced delusion and extremely high levels of aggression that, you know, sometimes I think to myself, if this person, I don't want to single anyone out or attack anyone, but if this person had absolute power, what would happen? You know, people would get hurt. I mean, it's that level of zealotry on display. If you can look directly into a camera and claim not simply that a man is a woman, but that anyone who won't follow you in saying something obviously untrue must be hurt. If you're capable of doing that, like what aren't you capable of? So this puts Republican voters in a really tough spot. And I think, and I think the Trump campaign proved that they're not fully satisfied with the offerings. It's easy to let your own side slide when the other side is a literally unacceptable option. And that's particularly true if you're a Christian because the hostility to faith, but to Christianity, traditional Christianity in particular, is really one of the animating forces on the other side. I mean, let's just kind of not lie about it. And I know that there are Christian leaders who pretend otherwise, but they're not telling the truth. Because the truth is, and they pretty much say it, they hate that worldview because it's a challenge to their claims of dominion. In other words, anyone who sincerely believes in God, an actual God, probably not gonna hand unlimited power to any person, right? So, so religious faith is a natural check on their power. That's true always and everywhere. And Christianity specifically is that. So if you're a Christian conservative, holy smokes, you on a gut level feel threatened. And I, I, I feel it too. So I get it. But this coming election, which is to say the 2024 cycle, is one of those weird moments where there's, as of right now, a pretty much open field. And we all have suspicions as to who's gonna run on the Republican side. On the Democratic side, who knows? Obviously, Joe Biden's not gonna be a real candidate in 2024. I won't belabor why, it's obvious. Do you have television sets? <laughs> so he's not. And I'm not gonna waste your time by reiterating my show and working myself into a leather. And it's so bad because it demonstrably is so bad. It needs no, <laughs> it needs no further evidence. So Biden's not gonna run again. He can't say that because the second you do say that you become a lame duck and your power ebbs. And so his chief of staff and deputy chief of staff and the people who are actually running the US government will not allow him to acknowledge the obvious, which is, are you kidding? We'd leave tomorrow if we'd chosen a competent vice president whom anyone likes, but we can't, we're stuck. So that, you know, is a, is a conundrum, it's a quandary for the United States of America, but it's also a guarantee of just a mad scramble for power. So basically nobody has an ironclad claim on either side to the nomination. No one could say it's mine. No, there's gonna be a fight on both sides. And that means lots of drama and ad revenue for the cable news channels, but more important, it means an opportunity for voters on both sides, I'm gonna confine my remarks to the Republican side, to really think through what we want. Because voters are in that unusual and not that frequently occurring position of having all the power. You got all the power. You can decide who represents you and on the basis of what issues. And my advice to you would be take that obligation slash opportunity really seriously. You can make them obey. They don't want an unlimited variety of things. They want to win elections. That's it. That's what they do. They win elections. And if they think doing one thing will get them there, they'll do it. If they think the other will get them there, they'll do it. You know, one out of a thousand has, you know, sincere, deeply held beliefs on which they will not compromise. And you sort of know who they are. They usually run out of Washington immediately because they're a massive threat. Oh, the guy who means it, get out of here. But everybody else can be convinced. They just need vote, voters to ask clearly for certain things. So here's what you should ask for going forward in this coming cycle, which again, begins this fall. The first thing you should ask for is candidates who talk about things that actually matter. 
one of the weirdest phenomenons as a man deep into middle age who was not raised in the digital realm, I was raised in the payphone realm, is the degree to which people live their lives out digitally. And that means their friendships occur online, sometimes their romantic lives occur online, and to a huge extent, their political lives occur online. They decide what's important by reading what other people on social media think is important. I can't imagine a worse way to determine what matters than finding out what's trending on Twitter or what's appearing in your Facebook feed. By the way, those media, by definition, are open to manipulation. Like, you can create the appearance of urgency or importance very easily with digital media. So politicians respond to this, and I'm amazed every single day when I watch politicians out there telling me what's the most important thing. Now, you know, I'm older and a little cut off just by definition because of my job, hard for me to go to CVS. But I live enough in the material world that I'm like, wait a second, I don't know a single person who's telling me, as Mitch McConnell recently told us, that the most important thing in the world is to vanquish Vladimir Putin. Now, I'm sorry, you know, like you don't have to be, I'm not a Putin defender, despite what you may have heard. I don't really care one way or the other because he's not my president. He doesn't preside over my country and what he does in Ukraine, well, I think historically significant, certainly significant to Ukrainians, is not more significant to me than what gas costs. In fact, it's not even in the same universe. The rising price of fossil fuels is not an inconvenience, it's the whole story. Having spent a lot of my life traveling through poor countries, I can, poor countries, by the way, who send people here who immediately succeed in our system, which tells you, they're, you know, there are smart people in those countries who work hard. That's not the problem. Cheap energy, cheap fossil fuels make the difference between living in the Central African Republic and Des Moines. There are other differences. Nothing is that simple. But if you were to isolate the single largest contributing factor to prosperity, life expectancy, a politically placid system, it would be cheap fossil fuels. That's like why we're rich. And we happen to have the largest reserve of recoverable oil in the world. And so if the price of fossil fuels in our country, holder of these reserves, our single most valuable natural resource, shoots up, that doesn't simply mean it's hard for the proverbial guy with a 100-mile commute. It means everything's more expensive. It means you have less autonomy. Gasoline is autonomy. I can get my truck and drive wherever I want. I don't have to ask permission. It's freedom, but it's the basis of our standard of living. So if, and you don't need to be an economist to know this. So if that rises and you continue to get leaders, leaders that you vote for, whose campaigns you fund, who can look directly into a camera and say the single most important thing in the world is in a material sense, totally unrelated to your life or the life of any of the other 350 million people who live here, that's a huge problem. That's not democracy. Democracy is the process by which government represents the people who live there. This is a republic, a democratic republic. We are represented by members of Congress and the executive who by definition are charged with doing what we want because it's our country. So to the extent that doesn't happen, it's a violation of the democratic principle, the most basic one, and it's also a guarantee of volatility. What happens when people think their votes don't matter? Well, I mean, we, we saw it happen on January 6th. They get moved to action. They get so frustrated. No one will listen to me. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm showing up. I'm going to go to their doorstep. And over time, it gets worse than that. So if you want to keep your political system stable, you have to pay attention to what people actually want. And you have to pay attention to their deepest concerns, not their peripheral ideological concerns. Are we doing enough for trans swimmers? Can we prevent, you know, Putin from taking Crimea? What are we doing about climate change? I mean, you know, you can make the case those are all important things, I guess, but they are not more important than your actual concerns. And too often Republican voters, and this is the rule on the left, it should not be on the, the rule on the Republican Party, however, I try to pay attention to the markers 
the real markers of societal health. And those are the basics. The farther you get away from the basics, the more misled you are, the farther from the target you are. So what are the basics in your life? Well, if you're a parent, there's one basic. How are the children doing? You're as happy as your unhappiest child. Of course. How are your children doing? How are they doing physically, emotionally, spiritually? Are they thriving? Do they live in a country that promises them the ability to thrive going forward? Will you by knowing your descendants will be as happy and secure as you have been? Is there something that matters more than that? Is there a more important question than that? No, there's not. And anybody who says there is, again, is either so deluded that person should not have power or that person's lying to you, period. And in retrospect, of course, you never appreciate the significance of things as they happen to you. You can't really know what the movie's about until it ends. But at the time, we didn't really appreciate how, well, two things. One, our entire political orientation was based on this between the United States and the Soviet Union, this cold very much. And every part of our politics, as you well remember, those of you my age and older remember, every part of our politics revolved around that central conflict. We were in conflict with a country that was both anti-markets and anti-Christian. And that put in stark relief our own beliefs. And what would happen when that ended, when there wasn't that clear contrast? That's the first thing. And of course, the second thing is we could never have known the third week of August 1991, as we saw totalitarianism, that it would ever come here. We just couldn't imagine that. You know, we believe that victories were permanent. They're not, of course. That's the first lesson of history. You know, nothing is permanent except our own demise and God. But we didn't kind of get that. You know, if you told me then that this week, the Department of Justice would have indicted a group of people, people I don't agree with, by the way, on a lot of different issues, black nationalist socialists from Florida, okay, kind of not my demographic, but would have indicted them for criticizing the U.S. position, the Biden administration's position on the war in Ukraine and charged them with felonies for which they're each facing 10 years in prison. If you told me that could happen here, I would have laughed at you. No, we have a First Amendment. Like, that can't happen here, but it, it has, that and a lot of other things. I would say two things that are, I think we're thinking about. The first is, is you look around and you see so many people break under the strain, under the downward pressure of whatever this is that we're going through. And you look with disdain and sadness as you see people you know become quislings, you see them revealed as cowards, you see them going along with a new, new thing, which is clearly a poisonous thing, a silly thing. You know, saying things you know they don't believe because they want to keep their jobs. If there's a single person in this room who hasn't seen that through George Floyd and COVID and Ukraine, raise your hand. Oh, nobody? Right. You all know what I'm talking about. And you're so disappointed in people. You know, you are, and you realize that the herd instinct is maybe the strongest instinct. The instinct, which again is inherent to be like everybody else and not to be cast out of the group, not to be shunned, that's a very strong impulse in all of us from birth. And it takes over, unfortunately, in moments like this, and it's harnessed, in fact, by bad people in moments like this, to produce uniformity. And you see people going along with this, and you lose respect for them. And that certainly happened to me at scale over the past three years. Really, you're putting your pronouns in your email? You're ridiculous. And of course, the opposite is also true. The more you lie, the weaker and more terrified you become. We all know that feeling. Use is the same way. It makes you weak and afraid. But you look around and you see these people and some of them really have paid a heavy price for telling the truth. And they are cast out of their groups, whatever those groups are, but they do it anyway. And I look on at those people with the deepest possible admiration. That would have been enough to cripple a normal president. It would have been more than enough to keep a normal president from running for office again. But it had virtually no effect on Joe Biden. Most media outlets ignored it completely or tried to spin Biden's relationship with his son as some kind of moral victory. Quote, the real meaning of the Hunter Biden saga, as I see it, wrote Nick Kristof of The New York Times, isn't about presidential corruption but is about how widespread addiction is. So a whistleblower produces a text message showing that Joe Biden was in the room with his son when his son was selling influence to an enemy power, the Chinese government. And ABC's take on it, Joe Biden is a father first, take it or leave it. What accounts for a response like that? Well, that's the way you talk when you've got nothing to fear from an upcoming presidential election. You don't even bother to think of an excuse for your candidate because 
you don't need to. Your country has electronic voting machines. Joe Biden got 81,282,916 votes in 2020, and you're pretty sure he can do it again. In fact, you know he can. You're not worried. But actually, they should be a little worried. The people who control Joe Biden, Susan Rice, and the rest know they can continue to run our government, writing the press releases, formulating the policies, and they can do it effectively forever, as long as Joe Biden gets dressed in the morning. And of course, that's their strong preference. These are fervent opponents of change. But the one thing these people cannot control is aging. Joe Biden is old. He's 80 now. He'll be 85 at the end of the next term. People imagine that old age is a long, predictable progression from acuity to permanent unconsciousness. But often that's not at all how it actually works. When old people start to slide, they tend to slide fast. Joe Biden has begun that descent. You weren't supposed to hear that. Joe Biden read the stage directions out loud. That's like eating the garnish that comes with your entree. You're supposed to know not to do that. Joe Biden no longer does. In a year or two, he will be gone completely and there will be no hiding it. At that point, the Democratic Party will face a secession problem. If Joe Biden is reelected next year and then forced to leave office during his term due to disability or that means Kamala Harris will become president of the United States. And nobody wants that, not even her husband. In real life, nobody likes Kamala Harris. That's not an attack on her. In fact, it's possible to feel pity for someone who's so universally reviled. It is instead an observation of unchanging physical reality like gravity or photosynthesis. Nobody wants Kamala Harris to be president. No one will benefit if she becomes president. So logic suggests there's gonna be a change. It's gonna to have to be somebody else. And whoever that person is, is gonna to have to enter the race soon before the election after Biden drops out. Who could that person be? We don't know, obviously, this is all just guessing, but we do know whoever that is will have to have two essential criteria. He'll have to be as shallow, ruthless, and transactional as Joe Biden is, and he'll need to have flattery skills that are so polished and advanced, they'd be considered superior even in the Saudi royal court. And there's only one man in modern America who fits that description, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, and perhaps not coincidentally, Joe Biden's new closest friend. I am here, Mr. President, Newsom told Biden at an event the two did together last week. I am here as a proud American, as a proud Californian, mesmerized by not just your faith and your devotion to this country and the world we're trying to build, but by your results, by your action, by your passion, by your capacity to deliver. I am mesmerized by you, Joe Biden. Imagine saying that as a compliment. You couldn't do it. Few human beings could do it. But Gavin Newsom had no problem at all. Those words rolled right off his forked tongue. He never stopped smiling. So if you're looking for the leader of the coup, there he is right there. If you say, well, you know, I think abortion is always bad. Well, I think sometimes it's necessary. That's a debate I'm familiar with. But if you're telling me that abortion is a positive good, what are you saying? Well, you're arguing for child. Obviously, I, of course, I understand that. And I have compassion for everyone involved. But when the Treasury Secretary stands up and says, you know what you can do to help the economy get an abortion? Well, you're, that's like an Aztec principle, actually. There's not a society in history that didn't practice human. Not one. I checked. Even the Scandinavians, I'm ashamed to say. It wasn't just the Mesoamericans. It was everybody. So like, that's what that is. Well, what's the point of child? Well, there's no policy goal entwined with that. No, that's a theological phenomenon. And that's kind of the point I'm making. None of this makes sense in conventional political terms. When people or crowds of people or the largest crowd of people at all, which is the federal government. So that should be the single-minded focus of any political party, particularly the Republican party, because there's no option. The other party is, and this, oh, you see this happen in politics, though, never more so than now. The parties, of course, pivot against each other. Oh, you're for that, I'm for the other thing. It's, it's childish, but it's real. So all of a sudden you have a political party that is making a case against having children. Making a case for devoting your life to some soulless multinational corporation. I'm not against all businesses. I've always been for free enterprise. 
But when I hear people say, you know, abortion's the most important thing, the most important right that we have, I ask myself, what are you really saying? I mean, honestly, think about it for a second. And, some, and I am a pro-lifer, just to be completely clear, a, a fervent one. But what are they really saying? So conservatives, you know, I think very often begin with the debate over whether this is a life and whether abortion is ending a life. Well, that's not really a debate. Everybody knows that it is. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. Even the people screaming, I'm proud of my abortion. If you really felt good about it, you probably wouldn't be so brittle and loud, would you? I'm really happy about my marriage. I'm not putting on a sign and yelling at people, what happened with my marriage? <laughs> Suggest maybe I'm not quite as happy as I claim to be. <laughs> I'm proud of my abortion. Yeah, no, you're not. You're sad about it because it's inherently sad. You know, so that's not really a debate, and we can debate what limits should be put on it, but we need to take three steps back and ask ourselves, what is this exactly? What are they really saying? What are they promising to the American population when they pr promote this? And what they're, of course, saying, and what Citibank and Nike, Dick Sporting Goods, and all these huge companies that are affirmatively promoting abortion by paying their female employees to have abortions, we're suddenly admitting it's female employees, which is, you know, take your victories as you get them. What are they really saying? They're really saying it is more important to serve us than to have a family. You will be happier as you rise within our company than you would be if you had your own children. Now, I never hear any Republican push back against this, but I can't imagine a more grotesque and obvious lie. Children are the most enduring source of joy. This is not an ideological point. It is true. Even when they go wrong, as they do. And by the way, it's never the parents' fault. Father of four, a little defensive. No, my kids are great. But, but they do go wrong, actually. And sometimes tragedies occur with your own children, and there's nothing more heart-wrenching but it doesn't detract from the unchangeable fact that children are the main source of joy and meaning in the human life, period, period. So anyone who tells you, no, what you really want, what you really want, Miss 28-year-old Citibank employee, is to move up to assistant vice president in charge of international bonds. Really, really? Is someone from the HR department going to hold my hand in hospice 40 years from now? Is the company going to love me unconditionally? No. It's a lie. It's a lie. And in telling that lie, they are stripping young Americans of the promise of the only thing that matters, which is having a family. Ask anybody who's old, like over 50. What's your greatest achievement? What has brought the most meaning to you? What do you care about? You don't even need to get the proverbial dead scene. Where it is true, and this is a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's accurate. Not one person has ever said, you know, I should have worked on Saturdays. Honestly, imagine my 401k. That has never happened and it never will. And it won't because it's a measure of the relative importance of work versus children. Work is necessary. In fact, it's required. In fact, if you're a Christian, you believe we were sentenced to it in the garden. I don't know if you remember that part. You will work. It wasn't a prize. It was not an award. <laughs> it was a punishment. And if you're blessed, you wind up having a job that, you know, most of the time you kind of think is great. I mean, I feel the way about my job. I like my job. I can say whatever I want. I can tell the truth. Uh, that didn't used to be a big thing. In 1991, when I started, it was like, yeah, everyone gets to do that. Right, okay. <laughs> Just me. Anyway. But it's still work. It's still work. And in the end, and the unchanging fact of life is that it ends, something else we try to hide and disguise and distract ourselves. I'm too busy on my iPhone. I die. I don't think I do. Anyway, return some more texts. But we do. That's the fact. The unchanging fact is your work actually doesn't mean very much in the end. In the end, it does not. So imagine a ruling class, the people with actual power, committed to telling young people that it does. 
and doing so with the aid and the financial backing of the biggest companies in the country. Decide that the goal is to destroy things. Destruction for its own sake. Hey, let's tear it down. What you're watching is not a political movement, it's evil. And just say, if you wanna know what's evil and what's good, what are the characteristics of those? And by the way, you know, I, I think the Athenians would have agreed with this. This is not necessarily just a Christian notion. This is kind of a, let's say, widely agreed upon understanding of good and evil. What are its products? What are these two conditions produce? Well, I mean, good, is characterized by order, calmness, tranquility, peace, whatever you want to call it, lack of conflict, cleanliness. Cleanliness is next to godliness. It's true, it is. And evil is characterized by their opposites. Violence, hate, disorder, division, disorganization, and filth. So if you are all in on the things that produce the latter basket of outcomes, what you're really advocating for is evil. That's just true. I'm not calling for religious, far from it. I'm merely calling for an acknowledgement of what we're watching, which is not what, and I'm not certainly not backing the Republican party. I mean, ugh. I'm, I'm just noting what's super obvious. Like those of us who are in our mid fifties are caught in the past in the way that we think about this. One side's like, no, no, you know, I've got this idea and we've got this idea and let's have a debate about our ideas. They don't want a debate. Those ideas won't produce outcomes that any rational person would want under any circumstances. Those are manifestations of some larger force acting upon us. It's just so obvious. It's completely obvious. And I think two things, one, we should say that and stop engaging in these totally fraudulent debates where we are using the terms that we used in 1991 when I started at Heritage as if maybe, you know, I could just win the debate if I marshaled more facts. I've tried that, doesn't work. And two, maybe we should all take just like 10 minutes a day to say a prayer about it. I'm serious, like why not? And I'm saying that to you, not as some kind of evangelist, I'm literally saying that to you as an Episcopalian. The Samaritans of our time. I'm coming to you from the most humble and lowly theological position you can. I'm literally an Episcopalian, okay? And I don't care if I sound like Bernie Sanders, that's true. That is absolutely true. They're promoting the idea that your family is worthless compared to loyalty to your employer and a political party. That is the sickest message I can possibly imagine. It's a totalitarian message, by the way. If the boss said, disown your own spouse, hurt your own children, you'd be out of there. There's no job from president to road builder that is worth hurting your own family. And that's a universal sentiment. They believe that in Burkina Faso. They believe that here in Des Moines. That's just how people are. Their family is the most important thing. So whenever someone tells you, no, your family's not the most important thing, don't have one, you know there's a problem. Republican leaders should be focused on this to start with. This should be the organizing idea of everything that goes after. Can your children grow up in a country pretty much like the one you grew up in? Can you give that to your descendants? And do you have descendants? And by the way, if life expectancy falls, if fertility rates fall, if testosterone levels fall, if sperm counts level, levels fall, all of which have, by margins that are unprecedented in American history and nobody notices, and there's no candidate who says, it, wait a second, people aren't having kids. Like, is the, find a clearer measure of societal health. If you believe in the future, if you feel confident in your economy and your society, you have pups, of course. They should start there. Here's the second thing they should do, and no one will ever do this, but I think this every day. They should care about beauty. I don't think I've ever heard a politician mention beauty. And I think about it constantly. I think about it on a couple levels. First, I think about it on a political level. So you, and I'm hardly a Bible scholar, but of course, how do you judge a tree? by its fruits, right? You don't judge it by 
you know, what the arborist told you it was. You wait till it produces something and then you know what it is. Oh, those are pears. They told me it was an apple tree. Well, I guess they guessed wrong. So the way that I judge ideas is by their fruit. And not just their ideological fruit, their physical, tangible, observable fruit, the things they make. So everything that we see around us is the product of ideas, of ideologies. That's where everything starts. In the beginning, there was the word. It starts with a word, always. And here's how we know if the ideology is a good one. Noble ideologies produce beautiful results. They produce beauty. Poisonous ideologies produce ugliness. Super simple. There's a reason the architecture in Bulgaria in 1975 was hideous. Because Sofia in 1975 was controlled by the Soviet Union. Soviet architecture was horrifying. So was architecture under Mao. They knocked down everything worth having, built during the preceding millennia, and they replaced it with concrete boxes. Why'd they do that? Because those boxes, those buildings, that architecture, that design, sent a very clear message, which is, you are worth nothing. There's no beauty for you. Now, why is beauty so important, and why did tyrants always destroy it? Well, they destroy it because beauty reminds you that the most important things are eternal. They're unchanging. Beauty is recognizable across cultures, across centuries. You can go to a place, a culture you're completely unfamiliar with, and if you see something beautiful, you recognize it immediately. Why? Because beauty has balance and symmetry and grace. You know it instantly. A beautiful face in this culture is very similar to a beautiful face in that culture. A beautiful building, same thing. It has balance. Why? Why does beauty have balance? Because it's derived from nature. It's derived from God's creation. So the closer we are to God's creation, the straighter the path and the better the path. So I look, I look at the country because I, I, I've traveled a lot, I've been to all 50 states. I've been, as I said, I've been everywhere because I did it for a living for so long. And I noticed that virtually everything built after 1945, less attractive, less pleasing, less human-centered than everything built before. I don't know what towns you all live in, but think about your own town. The prettiest buildings are built in 1920. That's just true. Clavers, front porches, steel roof. The closer you get to our current moment, the more everything looks like a dollar store. And the Republican Party somehow found itself in this position where they feel like they have to defend the aesthetics of the dollar store and the economics of it. Oh, it's the dollar. Well, that's free enterprise. No, it's not. It's an atrocity that diminishes people, that destroys God's creation, that oppresses us with its ugliness. That is true. And no one wants to say it because like, I don't know, some libertarian think tank was paid to tell you that the dollar store is attractive? I don't think it is, actually. I don't think it is. But they're able to think of these schemes that in fact destroy the environment. And by the environment, I mean the land. Because they don't care about beauty. What's beautiful? Is a wind turbine beautiful? No, actually, rivers are beautiful. Gardenias are beautiful. Springer spaniel faces are beautiful. Children are beautiful. The sky is beautiful. These are not things that people made. These are things that God made. And the Republican Party must defend them, not by acquiescing to their ridiculous climate change arguments, which are absurd. I could bore you for hours on this. But by defending the land from those schemes. From the, no, you, you can't desecrate something you didn't build, and that hill you did not build. Get your stupid wind turbine off there and slink back to New York. And the Republican Party should be about nature in human relationships. And I won't go through it again. But the most basic desire of most people, not every single person, but of most people, the overwhelming majority of people is to mate and have children and to perpetuate the species. That's not a desire that you were taught in college. People who've lived in total isolation come to that conclusion because it's not a conclusion. It's an instinct. That's nature. You need to be really wary of candidates who care what the New York Times think. You really, really do. No, and I mean that. And if you say that to Republican voters, you're like, well, of course, the New York Times is communist. Like, I don't even read it. Really, because your leaders do. And they really care. They really, really care. Now, how do you know that? They'll never admit it. 
And I'm sure many will come on this stage in the subsequent months and they'll attack the New York Times and whatever. But they don't mean it. And I know they don't mean it because I watch them very carefully when things go sideways. That's how you know who someone is. I'll never forget that. I mean, I had no idea who George Floyd was. Nobody did. I didn't know the backstory. I had no idea. I saw the video. It looked bad to me. But what do I know? You know it's always more complicated than that. Nikki Haley, who I've always liked. I like Nikki Haley. She's charming. She's smart. Popular in South Carolina. Nikki Haley saw that. She's sitting at home. She sent a tweet out that said, I feel this. This is personal and painful to me. And I'm almost quoting. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And then she said, in order for healing to occur, what happens next must be personal and painful for everyone. I thought, really, why is that? And of course, what happened next was personal and painful for everyone. Our, our cities burned down and a lot of people. And I thought, why should what happened between a cop and George Floyd outside a convenience store in Minneapolis be personal and painful to anybody else? What are you even talking about? Oh, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're trying to please the people whose opinions you actually care about at the New York Times. That's just true. Doesn't mean she's a bad person. I don't think she is a bad person. I liked, I've always liked Nikki Haley. She was right here, I tell her to her face. I like you. Don't want you in charge of anything. <laughs> because, because the second things get intense, the second the other side really unleashes and starts yelling so loudly that you can't think clearly, I want a leader who can still think clearly. So the national media is very much like a swarm of bees. They move together. They understand the New York Times doesn't have power without the Washington Post, NBC News, and CNN. They move as a group. They have the same message. But their main strength is aggression. They just come right at you. You're a racist. What? No, I'm not. By the way, after many years of being called names, I've realized that if you criticize white liberals, you're a racist. <laughs> it always cracks me up. I always think to myself, wait, what? No, I, I'm not mad at black people. I, I don't like you. <laughs> How is that racist? I mean, you know, maybe you've got a counter case to make. Maybe you've got really good qualities. But disliking you, Mr. New York Times reporter, who look exactly like me, does not make me a racist. When they come at you with some charge like, oh, you're working for Putin. Putin? I've never been to Russia. If I wanted to be there, I guess I'd already be there with Ed Snowden or something, but I don't. I live where I was born in America. Putin, 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 Putin. When that happens, and I can say because I've lived it, like, a lot, you need to maintain clarity. You have to maintain clarity. And that's the moment when you find out who's on your side. And I've just got to tell you, and I mean this, there are an awful lot of Republican leaders who, in the end, they're on your side. I mean, they like you or whatever. You're nice. Like, let's have another fundraiser. You know, you're great. How's your wife? You're great. But if it's a choice between selling you out or offending the New York Times, it's not really much of a choice. And you see this with the girls' sports stuff. Oh, it's a very complicated issue. No. Cheating is not complicated. If there's a dude competing in girls' sports, that's cheating. And there's no other word for it. And. If you're giving minor children that sterilize them, not a complicated issue. Sterilizing children, I can say I'm against that. I mean, just call me crazy. I just wanna, I wanna go out there and say this thing publicly. I wanna kinda come out of the closet as opposed to sterilizing children. Some say it's controversial. The number of governors I've talked to are like, well, it's a very complicated, really? In what sense is it complicated? So under on, on what circumstances are we for sterilizing children? Again doesn't mean you're a bad person if that's your reaction. Probably many people's reaction. It doesn't mean you're totally unfit for leadership. You are totally unfit for leadership. To get my vote, you do not need to be an ideologue. You don't need to explain some the you know, economic theory. You know, it's okay if you don't fully understand the Austrian school. But when it comes down to it, if people who've lived in this country their entire lives Sort of followed all the rules, mostly. Paid a lot to the government, hoisted the flag, sent their children into military service. For generations, if those people are getting shafted 
and you're not putting everything on the line to protect them and their children and their grandchildren and generations yet unborn, you just, you just don't deserve the vote of anyone. I mean that. So I will stop there. And I will say to you, I hope that you will hold them accountable in a real way and never be embarrassed to ask about issues that matter to you. There's no national council that determines what's supposed to matter to America. Twitter isn't real, okay? It's the domain of super unhappy people with empty personal lives and creepy political agendas. What matters to you is what matters to you. And you have every right, in fact, you have a constitutional duty to tell your representative to represent you on those issues.